Whitening Pines is former Liberal Democrat Minister, in fact, Home Office Minister, Norman Baker. Norman, welcome. Good evening to, to you, Nigel. Nice Pines. to see you. And very good to see you. Now, I have, a, I have a glass of water here because I always take the view that you shouldn't drink before you go on air because I might um, say something I shouldn't. However, but you've been doing that for years anyway. <laughs> However, I've brought you an excellent pint of Harvey's Old Ale from the brewery in Lewis. And as you know, Harvey's is a fantastic brewery. It really is, and I'm very grateful. Thank you very much indeed. The last person that bought drinks in was Jacob Rees-Mogg, and it was his homemade cider. It was um, mm, interesting. I can guarantee it's better than I, that. I, I'm going to be very happy there. I know <laughs> I am. Thank you. Well, of course, let's start there, shall we, with Lewis? Because... Liberal members of Parliament anywhere in the east of England. There was Clement Freud, pretty much on his own in Cambridgeshire for yes. years. And yet you won this seat in Lewis all the way back. And, and you held it for, what, 17 years? 18 years. years. 18, years. Yeah. 18 years as a Lib Dem member in Sussex. That was amazing, wasn't it, being an MP for that amount of time for that party? Well, the average length of time for an MP, I think, is seven and a half years. Yep. And, uh... and for a Liberal? Probably less. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was the first non-Tory since 1874. Yep. And there's obviously been Tories subsequent to me, so I'm, I'm the exception that proves the rule or something. Um, it's a fantastic seat, Lewis. I love it deeply. It's a great place. Lewis is a very quirky, independent, bolshy town. Sort yeah. of place you would like, Nigel, yeah, of course. No, and they have their bonfire parades and they all do. the things they do. And Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And lovely countryside, uh, National Park, Glyndebourne, and everything else down there. It's and New Haven, of course, a working port and a fishing yeah, port. Yeah, a very honest place. Very yeah. honest place. And yeah. I, liked, I liked it very much indeed. No, it's, well, it's, great I mean, it's a long time to do it. And you did go on to the Home Office as a minister. And, and I've just been, before you came on air... Uh, we've just been talking about the fact that these M25 protests, which, yeah. you know, it's, it's costing people money, uh, people are missing flights, missing funerals, all the rest of it. But what absolutely drives me mad is the government, the Home Office, keep talking tough. Some of these protesters that were arrested today, it's the fifth time in ten days. Yeah. What should we do? It's very difficult. I mean, first of all, let me say I don't agree with those protests at all. And I think anyone who wants to convince the public of their case should do so in a way that doesn't disrupt the general public, and they should do so in a humorous way that wins support and makes people laugh. That's, that's how you win your case, mm. not by stopping people in the 25 It's difficult to do. I mean, they've passed laws to, to uh, make it possible. Well, they've got a court judgment to, to make it yeah. possible they're, in, they're incarcerated. For 24 hours. For 24 hours. But, I mean, there's no, there's no disincentive. I mean, to be honest with you, if people are that motivated as these people are, I think, mm -hmm. they would welcome the fact to be locked up. They, they would see that as a badge of honour. Well, I don't mind locking them up. No, I'm sure you don't. No, uh, no, no but, well, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure the public would agree with me. Well, I'm sure they would, Nigel, but the point, the point is that they wouldn't mind being locked up. They would see it as a, right, as a well, victory. Well, 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 if that's what they want, let's give it to them. <laughs> now, Norman, I have to say, it's very interesting. Uh, I would call you a non-conformist. Almost. Or a maverick, I'm normally called. Well, you're certainly that, <laughs> but you're a non-conformist, and perhaps in the old-fashioned sense of the word, but almost verging on purism, aren't you, really? I mean, you... You disapprove deeply of the royal family. You seem to be quite sceptical of people who've got too much money. Um, you, I, yeah. That's not what, true, actually. What is it that you want us to be as, I, a, I want... as a people? I mean, I mean, clearly, you know, when you talk about corruption and, you, and you've yes. had lots of campaigns, and many of them admirable campaigns, but it does seem to be a very, very sort of hair shirt. Well, maybe it's my Church of Scotland upbringing when I, I was a young lad. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm not against the royal family if they pay their taxes properly and if they follow the same rules as everybody else follows. I'm not against the Benelux monarchies, which, when, they, when the king or queen comes to the throne, mm -hmm. they take an oath to uphold democracy. In this country, alone, we take an oath, we take an oath when we have to do anything, to respect the queen. That's the other way around in other countries. Well, it has given us very stable governments since, since 1688. It's, well, been, uh, it's been pretty effective compared to the rest of Europe, hasn't it? Well, I don't think that's necessarily to do with the royal family. But in, in, but in any case, I'm not against rich people. I'm against people who don't pay their taxes, which is a different matter entirely. Um, so it is a bit hair shot, I suppose. I mean, I was the MP, if you recall, who um, opened the can of worms on MPs' expenses mm. uh, with the first Freedom of Information request. Mm. I remember that, and I remember thinking, I bet Norman Baker is about as popular in Parliament as I, <laughs> as I am in the European yes, Parliament. That's, a, that's a fair comparison, actually. And it didn't help that I called for MPs to pay for their car parking charges, which are free in the House of Commons. Went over the road in Abingdon Gardens, Abingdon Green. It was then about £20 a day, probably a lot more than that now. You know, why should people who are on, on huge salaries get free parking at work? 
No, I, mean, no, no, I know that you, did, that, that, that you fought all of these campaigns, and, and, and I know that many of your parliamentary colleagues would have shunned you, and probably quite a lot within the Liberal Democrats would have shunned you, but you were there during a period. You know, we were coming out of the end of the Paddy Ashdown period yes. of, of very effective leadership of the Liberal Democrats, and Ashdown, you know, with energy, toured around the country and gave these speeches. Yeah. And, and I watched him and I thought, wow, you know, this guy's really good at this, yeah. really good at this. Charlie Kennedy, who I have to say was the politest of men, you know, charming, delightful. But again, somebody I disagreed with, but could have a sensible, grown-up, civilised conversation with, and sadly that all ended very tra as his life ended very tragically. Uh, and you go on to Nick Clegg, and suddenly, you know, you've gone from being this tiny little party, and you've got 60, was it 65, the most seats? 62, I think, at the most. Yeah. 62, I mean, you're, three, you're over 60 seats in Parliament, yeah. you're into a coalition government. Yeah. What went wrong? What went wrong was that um, we tried to play the game properly. We tried to play it as fair partners to the Conservatives, as they did, by and large, actually, to us. Um, but whenever anything went wrong, we got the blame. And people remember, what do they remember about it? They remember tuition fees, which was a disaster on our part. But they don't remember uh, the things we did, the triple lock pension, uh, the reduction in income tax for those on, on low incomes, the free school meals, the massive investment in the railways. They were all our campaigns, Nick, the things we did. But Nick Clegg broke a very specific promise that was made to he did. people. He did, he uh, did. Uh, but, I mean, that was a lightning rod, Nigel. Had it not been that, it would have been something else, I think. You know, on day one, near enough day one, we had a meeting with our... Um, uh, European partners from, from Holland um, and they came across and said look you're the junior partner in, the, partner in this uh, coalition you will get the blame for things that's the way coalitions work and I think it's the same elsewhere I don't think we're unique in that but you know I said to people at the time give us a break we've been out of government for 90 years you know <laughs> and we haven't we haven't got the same experience the Tories have got and actually we've got quite a lot right and I, I was I would say to people look back at that government between 2010 and 2015 it's a pretty good government, pretty stable. We inherited that situation from, from the Labour yep. with the financial mess. It was a pretty stable government. And you look at what's happened since 2015, I would say that actually we've produced a much better government because we had to convince the Conservatives of what we wanted to do and they had to convince us. And that's no bad thing, convincing somebody outside your own ranks. No, look, I mean, the argument that coalitions don't work, I mean, much of post-war Germany has operated exactly. on coalitions. And, and we designed and, it. And, and pretty effectively, you know. But, Norman, two big things have happened since then. One is a complete collapse of support for the Liberal Democrats. Are they relevant right now? Well, I'm not an active Lib Dem. I'm still a Lib Dem, but I'm not active. You're still a member, are you? Of course. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'll always be a Liberal in my, throughout my life because yeah. that's very important. The issue of the balance of the power between the state and the individ individual, which you will understand very well... I do, and I wonder... What, absolutely key... So why are the thing. Liberals so illiberal? Why well, are the Liberal uh, Democrats so illiberal? Well, they, I mean, I mean they, say they want to ban things and stop things and tax things. It's not a very liberal party, is it? Well, in some cases it's not, but, I mean, in many other cases it is. I mean, we were very keen to... Another thing we did in coalition was get rid of ID cards, which, of course, Labour wanted to introduce at the end of their period, and we said, no, we're not having ID cards. You know, I don't want the state... But you've following... supported all sorts of bans on different things. Well, I mean, who, personally, or are you talking about the party? No, the party. Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm not here to answer for the party, I'm here to answer for myself these days. Uh, I, you know, I'm not in favour, by and large, of banning things. Uh, banning things is, is, an, is a... Sometimes you have to do it, because you have to ban dangerous pesticides, for example, because they're in, injurious to health. There are cases when you, have to, when you do have to ban things, but by and large, I'm much more in favour of convincing people to do the right thing. And I'm in favour of using the economy to achieve the right results. I think if you tax bad things and reduce tax on good things, then you nudge people in the right direction. But they can still do what they want to do, which is... A, which is um... And how can, Norman, how can a classical liberal, somebody that believes in a sort of Joe Grimmond type philosophy, someone that believes properly in democracy and accountability and all of these things, it's a, it's a miracle to me that anybody that calls himself a liberal could ever have supported the European Union, could ever have supported <laughs> that monstrous, monstrous undemocratic structure. And yet the Liberal Democrats have been the fanatics for the European Union, fanatics for us joining the I Euro. I don't think fanatics a fair word. I mean, I think there was a well, lot of... Well, I, let me assure you, you know, I worked alongside Nick Clegg and others uh, in the European Parliament when he was there. Um, you, know, you have been the party that believed in the project. Yes. Uh, and maybe that's done you damage as well in terms well, of... Well, I don't know. I mean, we believe, people like me, and I'm not alone in this believed that it was important to be in the European Union, but it didn't stop us being highly critical of elements of it, of, of the fact that the accounts were not signed off properly, mm. of the common agricultural policy. You know these issues, Nigel, probably better than I do. Mm. There was lots wrong with it, but we happen to think, I think I still do, and I think we've been proven right subsequently, actually, we're better off in 
than out. Um, which isn't to say it was perfect, it wasn't. Indeed, if you look at my predecessor in Lewis, Tim Rathbone, yep. who was highly uh, pro-Europe, um, when I took over the seats, the only seat in the country which went from Tory to Lib Dem became more Eurosceptic. Euro <laughs> <laughs> but wasn't it... I mean, look, I, I'm going to put this to you, and I put it to, indeed, to Vince Cable a month or two back when he was sitting in that yeah. chair. We had a referendum, right? A national referendum. There was a very clear result. Well, it was, it was, it well, was a very big margin. Two forty-eight. A very, a very big margin. Yeah. One point four million vote margin in favour of leaving, and yet your party and many others put us through three and a half years of torment, of agony, uh, attempting basically to overturn the. Well, result. I don't know. That's entirely fair. They I mean, want, but they wanted us to vote again. You wanted us to vote again, didn't you? Uh, well, personally, I think it was important to try to. Come up with, uh, given a narrow margin, you said one point something million. Massive margin. It was four percent. Uh, it was a great big margin. It was fifty-two forty, so, which is so quite do you, close. Do you, do you, I mean, but, do you not accept democratic results, Norman? Yes, uh, but I'm also aware that um, uh, some time before, if I may say so, uh, you said that it was fifty-two forty the other way. You wouldn't accept that result. No, I never said that. Uh, I, said, that I, I, I said for some it would be unfinished business. Right. But had it been fifty-two forty-eight your way, yes. there'd have been no talk of a second referendum, and you know that. No, I don't. As well think as I, I, know I think that. I think that. You've been a very effective campaigner, Nigel. You've been, uh, unfortunately, you didn't always have views that I agree with, but you've been a very effective but, but, campaigner. But, 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 but I, don't, I, don't think you would have, I don't think you and others would have accepted that. You'd have come back for more. There, no, but look, come on. Had it been 52-48 for Remain, uh, you know, basically that would have been accepted, would have moved on. I don't think it would have been. Of course it uh, would have been. But anyway, look, the, the issue you're the asking... Poli the political class, the political class of which you're a part... <laughs> I was. Basically thought the British people were too thick and stupid and they should vote. I don't think anyone's ever said that. I haven't said that. Um, there are all sorts of reasons why people voted the way they did. But look, I mean, the reason it was three and a half years of dispute, I think, was partly shock. But it was also partly... Yes, you were shocked. Very shocked. Yeah, how, shocked. how ordinary people I thought. think probably, probably your side was shocked as well to some degree. But there was, there was an Please. issue... Please. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There was an issue as to what exactly had been voted for. Because, as you know, there were a number of options at the time. To leave. It, full stop. Stayed. To leave. Yeah, but what did that mean? Did it stay in the single well, well, market? Well, what, what did staying in mean? Well, indeed. I mean, I um, mean let's, not, let's not rerun 2016, because it's done. Do you now accept Brexit? I think it's a fact. It's a fact. However, there are, you know, I think we should revisit elements of it. For example, the fact that if you look at the moment, there are queues outside our petrol stations. There are no queues in Northern Ireland, which is part of the single market. There's no carbon dioxide shortage in Northern Ireland, um, well, and there is over well, here. Well, 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 actually, there are also uh, plenty of shortages across much of the rest of Europe of products. Uh, lorry driver shortages across Europe as big as ours. Um, and... Maybe because we became the low-wage economy, we made HGV driving unattractive. Well, we did, yeah. I mean, very unattractive. And I, and I, you know, I think that part of the Brexit vote was a feeling that big businesses have taken advantage of European rules and, and open borders yes. uh, to drive down standards and drive down wages. But no, but on a lighter note... On a lighter note, yes. Let's not having, revisit that. Having, you know, said that you're a modern-day Cromwellian, non-conformist, <laughs> uh, Puritan... But, I mean, do, as a last I'm not, point... I'm not, I'm not in favour of banning drinking on Sunday. <laughs> not that <laughs> But you've got a ban. Now, you are the most unlikely person, <laughs> I would have thought. So, please, as a last part of this conversation, tell us about your band. Oh, well, I mean, look, look, music was in my life before politics. It's in my life after politics. It, it's made a black-and-white world colourful for me. That's how I describe it. Yeah. And if I just think about a band like the Beatles, the amount, amount of immense joy I've got from the Beatles over, over my lifetime, there's a song for every occasion. I can put on a Beatles album and it cheers me out whatever I do. Yeah. It's very important to me. So I have um, three radio shows a week. Um, no politics, just radio shows, doing music every week on my local FM station, which is fantastic. Yeah. And I've had a band which has been on and off since 1997. Before that, actually, 1994 before I was an MP, uh, which has just been, you know, pottering around, doing stuff in pubs. I've done three albums, and actually what I found was recording music in the studio was uh, actually more interesting than, than being in a pub, because in a pub you're limited by the musicians you've got yeah. and, and everything else. In a studio you can add bits and pieces. You can say, what about an oboe here and, you know, what about a whistle there or something? You can create and, music. And the, and the name of the band? The Reform Club. You can find it on YouTube. <laughs> Lots of good videos on well, YouTube. Norman, can I say, <laughs> can I say, much as we've often disagreed on things, we've always been civil to each other, which is how democratic exchange Indeed it should. should take place. Thank you for the beer. <laughs> and that was, that was Norman Baker, my guest for today, on Talking Pines. <laughs>